Hello and welcome to my recap of round six of the 2024 candidates. It's GM Max here and we're going to start with the game between Nepomnishi, who is equal in the lead going to the round, against Fabiano Caruana. And in this game we see Nepo play Scotch Four Knights, just playing very safely, not wanting to, to take any risks as such. So Bishop D3, D5, this is all pretty standard. You know, Castles as well, quite standard, realizing that you know, the white king will be a bit exposed if, if white grabs all the pawns. So castles, and black decides not to take on d5 actually, but to play the move bishop to g4 as an intermezzo, where after f3 and bishop to h5, the point is the takes queen d4 is just going to see the pawn get regained and, and black is just going to be fine in the rising position with no weaknesses to speak of. If you're enjoying the video, make sure to leave a like and also to consider subscribing. In the game, White played bishop to g5, black took back the pawn, and after takes, takes, knight d5, queen b2. The position basically just simplified, you know, not a whole lot, you know, really happened from here in a sense. Well, there was actually one moment that was, was somewhat interesting, because after knight e7 and king h8, White played this move of queen to e2 which does give Black the option of pinning the knight if, if he wants to go for that. Uh, or actually, rook a8 would be a, a blunder, in fact, because of a very nice little trap of knight g6 takes and queen takes e8, uh, which is possible even without the immediate back rank, mate, because take, take, and king h7 and, and rook b8 would actually be be winning here. Um, and if king h6, h4, and the, and the trap snaps shut, so... Actually, Queen 2 is a very sneaky trap by Nepomnishi, but in the game, uh, Karana did not fall for it. He played Bishop G6, and the uh, play just petered out more or less. Well, I'll just show you the, the final moves fairly quickly, but like it's just a, a completely you know symmetrical opposite-colored Bishop ending. And basically, at this point, just the play is trying to figure out a way to force a draw by repetition, because like even like a you know 1800 player would draw this as black, and yeah, draw is. It was agreed at this stage. Anyway, let's go on to the next game between Gukesh and Nakamura. And for this one, Nikaru had prepared another little surprise in Hyper Accelerated Dragon. And Gukesh played what's thought to be the optimal line, just going e5 and trying to take over the center. We had bishop g4, bishop e5, knight c6. And this approach of taking and playing castles and d3 is the approach that was recommended by Naturalis in one of his uh, Twitter threads. However, Nakamura came prepared with a, a new idea. Well, we can always check if it is actually a, a new idea as such. But yeah, it is. So instead of automatic bishop development, black played this move of c4, making it a bit harder for white to get in the move d3. Now, white could play the move b3 and you know try to damage the structure this way, but of course this is something that you know, Black would have also prepared before the game. So White, maybe not so ambitiously, just plays a move D3 and says, okay, let's just let you undouble your pawns and we're just going to play a, you know, a normal pawn structure from here. So Queen C7, Rookie 1, E6. I mean, the player's just played very well in this game. I mean, you know, White has a tiny bit of an advantage because of his grip on the dark squares, but Black is also just very, very solid. Um, knight c8 is kind of a creative move going for bringing the knight towards c4. If it were up to me, I probably would have just castled first, maybe waited for knight b3, and you know, perhaps then played knight c8 when they're not covering this square. But anyhow, it doesn't make the world's biggest difference in the game, where white goes c4, castles, bishop b2, a5, just starting to slightly loosen the white structure. a3 takes, takes, and you know, even though none of... White's move is sort of like obviously bad or anything. It turns out that Black has actually managed to sort of get the better side of equality in a in a position like this. But it wasn't really enough to make anything of like the pieces just get traded. Queen b5, queen e4, rook d8. You know, it's all very standard. Like White is successfully defending himself on these squares, and you know, the weakness of c6 and the weakness of b4 kind of even themselves out in the end. So after some basically shuffling, like you know. Obviously, you know, the players can't agree a draw before move 40, so they're just basically moving back and forth and, you know, waiting to, yeah, figure out a good way just to force all the pieces off the board. 
this away to do it and they hit move 40 so draw was agreed here so not too much to see with these two games but we can see from this that well Napa and Gukesh was still in the equal lead <clears throat> with four out of six and you know Kawana was the only one who could sort of catch him or overtake him in this round so now we have the fun question of well who uh what will other changes happen in the tournament standings a bit lower down and let's see our next game between Vidit against Ferusha. This was a little bit of a, a crush, actually. So let's see how it went. E4, C5, Knight F3, D6. So Ferusha doesn't play the Knight off as he used to, but plays the classical Cillian, another one of his old school, old time systems. Bishop C4, Sosen. Black plays Queen B6, trying to kick the White Knight out of the way before playing E6 so that there's less pressure on the e6 pawn. But it's also true the queen is maybe not ideally placed on b6 here. And with bishop f4, white does put pressure on this pawn, prompting a bit of a retreat with queen d8, queen d2, a6. And, and we can see that, you know, white is relying on the, the activity of his pieces to make something happen, like having pressure against the pawn on our d6 in this case. And actually here, Ferruja's move of bishop b7, as natural as it looks to try and put pressure on the e4 pawn. Um, note, by the way, that the idea of a3 was to you know, ensure we're not just losing a pawn to b4, and I take c4. But bishop b7 actually turns out to be a mistake. And what black should have done instead is played bishop e7, waited for long castles, and just gone knight e5 to defend the pawn this way. You're never really too concerned about the doubled pawns and the e file in the in the Sicilian, but you know, white could play moves like f3 or even directly g4, and definitely get a nice sort of English attack style attack where I think white is gonna have pretty decent chances, but of course black can still play as well. But after bishop b7, that's not really the case anymore. After queen b6 and g4, like white's just got a very, very strong attack where your h6 doesn't really slow things down because we're just gonna use the the G pawn as a hook, the H pawn as a hook anyway here. But black plays the move queen takes F2 instead, which has a few different problems to it, admittedly, where you know, you're just going way behind in development when you take such a pawn and sort of opening the floodgates to your own king. But Vidit found the very best move here in the move E5, just opening up that file on a D file. And if black does play D takes C5, white's point is that he'll just play bishop to E3, the queen moves somewhere, we kick it away with, you know, rook hg1. And after takes, it basically, yeah, it turns out that, you know, playing out a few moves, if like rook h1, we can see it basically the queen gets trapped, you know, white wins a piece and, and wins the, the game essentially. And if they go queen h3 instead, trying to avoid this, um, the problem is we just go bishop f1 then. Queen f3, bishop g2 would trap the queen because queen g4, bishop c6 and and discoveries but also after queen h4 bishop g5 the the queen gets trapped so what this means is that actually black can't take this pawn he's forced into the move knight to d7 so that now if bishop e3 at least the queen can you know kind of get away in a sense but yeah after he takes d6 it, it's just all over white is now up a pawn and he has actually you know a pawn taking material is equal but the bishop is just completely dominated and you know it's very hard for black to survive in fact it turns out white is just completely winning here and vidit yeah played it pretty well knight c5 queen d4 um computer will say there were some faster wins for white but i mean at the end of the day who really cares queen a7 bishop c6 queen a6 initially this might look risky because of rook a8 but actually we have the move bishop a7 just to block it and because we're covering c7, they just can't really make use of the pin. After g6, bishop b5, bishop h6. Like at this point, white's up two pawns. Like he's got, you know, four connected past pawns. And based on that, the result's not really in any doubt. You know, just to quickly show you the final moves. So a nice little way to break the pin with a counterattack. Queen a7, queen g4, bishop g7, queen c4. You know, we're just happy to trade off in a winning ending. Of course, Black's going to try to make something happen, but he's he's basically just dead. So Knight f6, Queen c5, again, trade off pieces when you're up material. Queen f6, and not very practical move from Vidit here, just Rook d5, kill the Knight, kill any counterplay, and 
after d7, rook d8, knight d4. With knight c6 coming to win even more material, Ferruja just resigned here. So we know from this that, you know, Vidit is now back to 50% and Ferruja is, you know, in minus three, as it were, on our one and a half out of six. But what happened in the final game? Well, the final game was played between Pragnananda against, uh, against Abasov and well, we can see that Prague won, but it's it's going to be instructive to see how he won. So it featured a semi tarash where you're know, having seen Abasov's approach this tournament of just holding solid draws against these guys. Well, we can be fairly sure he was going to go for the this variation with you know very solid play, but Prague decides to keep the tension in the position with the move e3, knight c6, and a3. But after Black's next move a6, I have to admit that. The move Prague played here is not one I'd really seen before, where I'd previously assumed that you know you more or less had to take and go B4 as happened in the Gukesh against Vidit game back in round one of the candidates. But Prague just played the move B3, just got kind of keeping that tension between the the pawns as such. And after C D4 and E D4, you know, if Black does take on C4, well we get this hanging pawn structure which definitely has a lot of dynamic potential to it. You know, the bishops can come here. Uh, and here, and, you know, you can probably play for the d5 break and such. So it definitely is sort of, you know, dynamic play that, that Prague wants. You know, if you've watched some of these early recaps, you'll probably have noticed already how Prague has really tried to play very dynamic chess in this event, and, you know, maybe knight e4 is perhaps a better way to get counterplay, because after b6, why just takes, plays b4, and this actually is a bit of a bind for black. You know, a5 is going to run into b5, the bishop on c8 is just very passive in the long term, and now knight e4 is in the game is a bit less effective than a couple of moves ago, because we just have knight a4 to kick the queen. In the middle game, we're just going to make use of that c5 outpost. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing that Gugge that Prague didn't play bishop d6 because he wanted to keep his pawn here defended, but you, know, you can just play bishop e3, it's, it's all fine. Uh, but yeah, bishop e2 might not be the best move, but it does still keep a, keep an edge for white. Bishop f6, bishop e3, knight e7. Now the knight jumps into c5, because if black were to take, then you know, we just get a very strong connected pass pawn that is really, you know, tying black up in this case. Bishop will come where four, and, you know, the, the position plays itself on the dark squares, right? In the game, black tried to move knight c3, you know, hoping to make something of the fact that he has the bishop pair, but when you're on a post bishop is this completely inept piece on c8, it's it's not gonna end well. Um rook b1 just a nice move putting the rook opposite the queen and preparing to preparing to create a pass pawn at, at the right moment. Black played e5 trying to break free. Take take. Um and interesting enough we actually yeah probably aren't gonna be in a hurry to take on e5 in general. Um still better for white but just the pin is a little bit annoying so this is why we saw Prague play rook f to d1 here. Black played to move d4, and you're trying to use tactics to, you know, take the, the pawn on h2 in a sense, if white were to take on d4. Interestingly enough, you actually probably should go for this line as white, where the h2 pawn is not that consequential, but having this, like, really strong pressure with, you know, knight c6 and you know, having some tactics based on the overloaded queen is is actually going to be something quite meaningful for white here yeah. um, and still it's very hard for black to develop his bishop even in a position as open as this one because our knights are really just covering everything here but in the game we saw the move bishop to g5 and this sort of allowed uh abasov to escape a bit where prague banked his copes on the move g4 and trying to trap the knight because you know if black had a retreat this would this would clearly be a disaster for black to effectively play about one of his pieces, but in the game, Black played the intermezzo of h6, which actually kind of keeps him in the game. So, but queen e4, take, take, so they can't take back with the bishop as such. Rook a7, rook takes d4, and it looks like white is much better here with the extra pawn and very active pieces. It turns out Black is actually still more or less okay with his bishop pair if he does play rook e7 and you know, just kind of sit on a position like this, saying that, you know, White's king is also a little bit exposed in the long term. But instead, Abasov played the move g4, 
the, the idea that, you know, queen g4 ends up bishop c5 and using the pin. And yeah, apparently to move rook to bd1 is actually meant to be very good. We end up like sacking a, a piece, but you get this like really strong attack with, you know, the queen coming in and, and such. But okay, a little bit of a computerish line, we have to admit. And the move in the game of knight g5 by Prague is, is still going to give white a very nice advantage. Where, yeah, we get back the extra pawn, but now we've got attacking chances on the on the h file. Which is why black played the move queen e5 here. Uh, offering a trade of queens, hitting the pawn on f5. White defended this with rook d5, take, take. And yeah, it's not an easy position for black to defend. You know, probably f4 is, is going to be the right square for the bishop. Just so that you can kind of, in many cases, like play bishop h6 and, you know, make sure they don't just mate you on the h file. But bishop e8 was played in the game and this allowed Prague to play a very nice move of f6, just preparing her to bring the rooks in the attack, essentially. Uh, the game went bishop f4, so correcting the mistake. And you're probably at yeah, rook h1 and just going for it would, would be the way I would play this if I was white. Um, but the game saw rook bd1 rook c7 and and it's much like in the game against gukesh we kind of see this back and forth where like white was winning and you know now black is so sort of managed to claw his way back to having a decent position but the thing is that because you're the one defending it does sort of take a a bit of a toll on you over time let's say and after rook to a8 black still has to defend quite precisely in order to to hold here where supposedly the best option is to go rook d6 and just basically not care about the queen side but just completely focus on the on the counterplay on the on the king side um like you're moving the rook and going this way but again it's a little bit computerish territory i think from a human point of view it's very natural to feel like why just going to queen is is b pawn or a pawn and win the game but yeah computers have their their own logic let's say but ultimately rook f6 was not really the answer to to black's problems here um you know white is well, the material is equal, but the problem for black here is that the rook is just completely dominated in this position. Uh, rook d5 runs into a knight f6 fork, and you know, rook b5, rook f b6 again takes advantage of the fact that you know any ending with the knight versus bishop is just going to be winning with the white already having even two pass pawns and you know, the outside one being the most pertinent. Black ends up playing king g7, which technically is a blunder. Like, black probably had to go bishop d2 and, you know, just accept that he's losing a pawn here. But, yeah, this gives more chance to survive. Though, admittedly, not many than the move king g7. Because what happens here is that Prague just plays the move of rook a5. And if black takes the rook, then, you know, there's just no good way to, to catch this pawn. Where almost in a study like fashion, we can see that wherever the bishop goes, like, the knight is just covering that square and white just queens the pawn and after king g6 a4 black's almost in a in a state of zugzwang here actually where white is gonna queen his a pawn like g3 take take a5 gf2 a6 and even bishop e3 doesn't help here because knight c5 cut knight five cuts off the bishop and the pawn will queen and and this is why uh, abasov resigned in this position so yeah as you can see here i decided to experiment with a bit of a shorter recap because I mean, it's sort of my logic is like, you know, it's that it's almost like I'm creating these videos like if I had zero subscribers because of how long it's since I, I created, uh, you know, video content on YouTube as it were, uh, at least for chess. Uh, but yeah, do let me know in the comments below, like what was your favorite part of this recap or what was your you know favorite move from these, these games? Uh, do let me know that. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the next one. Take care.